Now, Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse number 1, the Bible reads, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So here in chapter 12, we start out right away in the first five verses with a discussion of the birth of Christ. And I'm going to show you some places in the Bible that prove that this is the birth of Christ being discussed. And what's interesting about that is that when we get to the end of Revelation chapter number 11, and, and go back if you would just a quick review of the end of chapter 11. Look at verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So there's a finality there with the sounding of the seventh trumpet, and it's clear that that is the beginning of the millennial reign of Christ because of the verb there, are become. He says the kingdoms of this world are become, meaning that they have just now become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. That shows that we're going into the millennium, okay? So in chapter 12, all of a sudden, we're jumping back in time to the birth of Christ. So chapters 1 through 11 have been in chronological order. At the end of chapter 11, we have a finality with the sounding of the seventh trumpet. We're ready for the millennium to begin, the millennial reign of Christ. Then in chapter 12, all of a sudden we jump back in time and we're at the birth of Christ. And basically what's going to happen now is that from chapter 12 onward, we're going to tell the whole story all over again of everything that we saw in chapters 1 through 11. We're going to see the tribulation all over again. We're going to see the rapture once again. We're going to see God pour out his wrath once again. And so the book of Revelation is in chronological order, but you have to split it in half. Chapters 1 through 11 are in chronological order. Chapters 12 through 22 are in chronological order. Now let me prove to you that the uh, seventh trumpet sounding is the end of God pouring out his wrath and the beginning of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Because some people don't believe that. They believe that the vials come after the trumpets. They believe that, you know, the trumpet judgments take place and then the vials come after. But go to Revelation chapter 16 and I'll show you why that simply cannot be the case. There are many reasons why that cannot be the case. And I'm going to go over those more in my sermon on chapter 16. But just one thing to throw out there is uh, Revelation chapter 16 verse 10 this is the fifth vial. It says, And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. So whose kingdom was full of darkness when the fifth vial was poured out? It says that the vial was poured out upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. The beast's kingdom is full of darkness with the outpouring of the fifth vial. Well, what does it say at the seventh trumpet? The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever, which proves that the fifth vial comes before the seventh trumpet because of the fact that the trumpets and the vials are happening concurrently or at the same time. Basically, the way it goes is the first trumpet sounds, then the first vials poured out, second trumpet, second vial, third trumpet, third vial, fourth trumpet, fourth vial, fifth trumpet, fifth vial, sixth trumpet, sixth vial, uh, seventh trumpet and seventh vial take place at the same time. And I'm going to go over that in great detail in chapter 16. But right there is the evidence, or one of the many pieces of evidence, that the book of Revelation breaks down in this way. Now, it's interesting because when we start out the book of Revelation in chapter 1, we're in the first century A.D. because John is on the Isle of Patmos and he's speaking to these seven churches that are in the first century A.D. Then he's transported up to heaven to see the things which shall be hereafter. And he begins to see future events of the tribulation, of God's wrath being poured out. Well, chapter 12 starts out really in the same place in the sense that it's the same century because chapter 12 starts out in the first century A.D. 
just like chapter 1 did, because the birth of Christ is what is discussed. Then we go into the tribulation, uh, God's wrath, etc. But let's break this down, and let me first of all show you conclusively that this is Jesus Christ being mentioned in uh, Revelation chapter 12. It says in verse 1, There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And we're going to talk about the identity of the woman in a moment. But look at verse 2. And she being with child, with child means pregnant, she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, watch this, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, how does that relate to the birth of Christ? The dragon, or Satan, as he's identified later in the chapter, is ready to devour this child as soon as this child is born. Well, do you remember when Jesus Christ was born? and King Herod wanted to kill Jesus Christ. And obviously, King Herod was Satan's minion. He was a very evil, very wicked man, and he wanted to slay the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he tells the wise men, when they're sent to go find the baby Jesus, he says, go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. He had no intention of worshiping Jesus Christ. He wanted to go and kill Jesus Christ. Well, the three wise men were warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, and they went back to their own country another way. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, okay, he sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coasts thereof from two years old and under. And so this was a very wicked man that just murdered a whole slew of innocent little children, two years old and under. But what was his goal? To kill the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how did Jesus Christ escape that death if all the children under two years old were slain? Well, an angel of God appeared to Joseph in a dream and warned him to arise and take the young child and his mother by night and to depart into Egypt and to remain there until the death of Herod. So Jesus, as a little baby, was brought to the land of Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod, and then his whole family returned, and they came and dwelt in Nazareth. So that fits in perfectly with Revelation 12, 4, about the dragon seeking to devour the child as soon as it's born. Verse 5, And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Obviously, this is a reference to Jesus Christ. In Psalm chapter 2, verse 8, the Bible says, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with the rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. The context of that chapter is, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, which is quoted about the Lord Jesus Christ in Acts 13 and elsewhere. And so Psalm 2 is a prophecy about Jesus Christ ruling the nations and breaking them with a rod of iron. Then in Revelation 19, verse 15, when the Bible talks about Jesus Christ returning on a white horse for the battle of Armageddon, the Bible reads, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, watch this, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So Jesus Christ is described in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament as ruling all nations with a rod of iron. So the man-child can be none other than Jesus Christ, the child who's born to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And then it says at the end of verse 5, And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. This is referring to the ascension of Jesus Christ. Remember in Acts chapter 1, he ascended up to heaven and a cloud received him out of their sight. And the Bible says that at this time, he is seated at the right hand of the Father. So he was caught up unto God and to his throne. And he'll come again to judge the quick and the dead. And so in Revelation 12, we start out the chapter with the birth of Christ. So before we get into the rest of the chapter, the question is, who is the woman? And there's been a lot of debate about this because many have said that the woman is Mary because obviously Mary did give birth to the Lord Jesus Christ. So I could see where someone would look at this and say, okay, this could be Mary. It's a woman that's giving birth to Jesus. 
That makes sense, okay? Others have said that the woman represents the nation of Israel. Go back to Genesis chapter number 37, and I'll show you why people believe that this is the nation of Israel being pictured by the woman. And really, I've, I've scoured the Bible on this subject, man. I have studied every part of the Bible looking for, for clues on this subject, and I feel that I've left no stone unturned. This is really the only piece of evidence that I could really find to state that this could be Israel being referred to. And I'll tell you right now, I do not believe that the woman is either Virgin Mary or Israel. I'll tell you what I believe in a moment, but let me just show you all the evidence so you can decide for yourself. This is what people lean on who believe that the woman there is Israel. It says in verse number nine, and he dreamed yet another dream. It's talking about Joseph dreaming a dream and told it his brethren and said, behold, I have dreamed a dream more and behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren and his father rebuked him and said unto him, what is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. So right there, basically Joseph is having a dream about his father. And who's his father? Jacob, who was later renamed Israel. So his father and his mother and his 11 brethren are worshiping him, but they are seen in the dream as basically the sun, moon, and 11 stars. So because of that dream that Joseph had, people will often look at Revelation chapter 12, and they see a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars, and they connect that with Genesis 37, and they say this is the nation of Israel being referred to. And it's not a bad theory. I mean, I can see where they're coming from. There is some support for it, but honestly, I do not believe it for one second. And the more that I study this and the more that I've looked at this, the more it becomes clear to me that that is not the proper interpretation of this passage. Let me explain to you a lot of the reasons why. First of all, Jump down, if you would, to verse 13 of Revelation chapter 12. And what we're going to see in verses 13 through 17 is a little bit of the enmity and a little bit of this battle that's going on between the serpent and the woman. The serpent desires to kill the woman. The serpent uh, is persecuting the woman. Look, if you would, at Revelation 12, 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast under the earth, talking about Satan being cast out of heaven, also discussed in Daniel 12. It says, when the dragon saw that he was cast under the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. So the dragon is setting out to persecute the woman. She flees into the wilderness to escape. And it says that she is nourished from the face of the serpent. So notice how the term dragon and serpent are being used interchangeably. Then it says in verse 15, And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So what we see here is that that the serpent is trying to destroy the woman and the woman escapes. So because the woman escapes into the wilderness and is out of his reach, he sends water as a flood out of his mouth after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. But the earth helps the woman. The earth opens her mouth and swallows up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And then at the end of the chapter there in verse 17, it says the dragon was wroth with the woman, angry with the woman, it says and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So go back to Genesis chapter three. And I believe that what you're gonna see in Genesis chapter three is a much stronger correlation with what we see in Revelation 12 than Joseph's dream. And I'm gonna show you a few reasons why this is such a stronger correlation, why this makes so much more sense. In Genesis chapter three, Verse 14, the Bible reads, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. This is when God is judging the serpent after the serpent has beguiled Eve and caused her to sin, who then in turn got Adam to sin. It says in verse 15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. So who is he putting enmity between there? Who, who is the thee in that verse? The serpent, right? 
because he says, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman. So he's saying, I'm going to put enmity between the serpent and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. So he's putting enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And it says in verse 15 there, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, we know there that in verse 15, the seed of the woman that's being re referred to there that is going to bruise the head of Satan is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ will be born of the woman, right? Jesus Christ is, yes, God in the flesh, but he was also born of a woman. He had a human mother. And that is what is being prophesied here in Genesis 3.15, that there will be enmity between Satan and the woman and between Satan's seed and the woman's seed, meaning the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it says, it shall bruise thy head, meaning the seed of the woman or Jesus Christ shall bruise Satan's head. And thou shalt bruise his heel, meaning that Satan will bruise the heel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's also a passage in the New Testament that says unto believers that Satan shall be bruised under their feet shortly. So just as Jesus Christ will rule all nations with a rod of iron, but then it says in Revelation chapter number 2, to the church of Thyatira, he says that him that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end shall rule all nations with a rod of iron. Okay, so the Lord Jesus Christ will rule, but we will reign with him. Okay, the Lord Jesus Christ will bruise the head of the serpent. We will also bruise the head of the serpent, okay, is what the Bible teaches. So here we see an enmity between the woman and the serpent, a struggle between the woman and the serpent and between the serpent seed and her seed. And that struggle, I believe, culminates in Revelation 12, where we see the serpent persecuting the woman. Now, who are the seed of Satan? Well, that's simple. All throughout the Bible, we have people that are referred to as sons of Belial. Or in the Bible, in the New Testament, where Jesus looked at the Pharisees and said, you are of your father, the devil. The Bible talks about those that are twice dead, without fruit plucked up by the roots. The Bible talks about making people twofold more the child of hell as yourself. The Bible teaches that people who are sons of the devil, or for example, the parable of the wheat and the tares. Remember, the tares are the children of the wicked one. All throughout the Old Testament, the sons of Belial. Belial is related to the word Baal. Beelzebub, Bel, Baal, Beelzebub, Belial. These are all the same person, Satan. And so these are the children of the wicked one or what we would call reprobates, okay? And so these reprobates are the children of Satan. There is enmity between them and the Lord Jesus Christ. There is enmity between Jesus Christ and the devil. There is enmity between the woman and the serpent. And when we see in Revelation 12, the serpent persecuting the woman... I believe that ties in perfectly with Genesis chapter 3, where we see the enmity between the serpent and the woman. You say, well, what does that mean? Who is the woman? Well, if we were to put a name on the woman, it would not be the Virgin Mary. And here's why. Because when the, the devil goes to persecute the woman, it's when he's cast out of heaven. Okay. Well, according to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, Satan being cast out of heaven, if we compare... Daniel 12, 1 with Revelation 12, that is what starts the tribulation period, okay, is when Satan is cast out of heaven. Because it says that Michael will stand up for the prince of thy people, and he says, then shall be a time of trouble such as was not. And that's what we see in chapter 12. Look down, if you would, at your Bible there in Revelation chapter 12, verse number 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven, and the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And then it says in verse number 13, when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Now, there's also a time frame given of the time that the woman will be hiding in the wilderness from the face of the serpent. That time is given in verse 6 as 1,203 score days, and that time is given in uh, verse number 14 as 40 and 2 months, or a time and times and half a time, okay, which is three and a half years. Therefore, this cannot be the Virgin Mary because we know that the Virgin Mary died a long time ago. 
And so she's not going to be around in the tribulation to be persecuted by Satan for 1260 days or for 42 months. Okay, so that tells me it's not the Virgin Mary. And you say, okay, well, Pastor Anderson, why don't you believe it's Israel then? Well, first of all, to believe that it's Israel would be to ignore the strong connection between Genesis 3 and Revelation 12, which has nothing to do with Israel, which has to do with mankind in general. When we look at Eve, the Bible says that Eve was the mother of all living. And if the enmity was between Satan or the serpent and the woman, and that woman represented basically all of mankind because she was the mother of all living, that is a much stronger correlation. But not only that, the Bible calls Jesus Christ in the New Testament 89 times the Son of Man. I mean, that is a, a, a statement that is used over and over and over again. And in fact, the Bible emphasizes the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of Man much more than it does the fact that he was an Israelite or the fact that he was a Jew. Yes, Jesus Christ was born a Jew. Go to Galatians chapter 4 if you would. Yes, Jesus Christ was born a Jew. Yes, Jesus Christ was born of the seed of Israel, of the seed of Abraham, of the seed of David. But more than any of those things, the Bible emphasizes the fact that he is the son of man. 89 times he is referred to as that. But when it comes to the gender of his actual human parent, it wasn't a man at all, was it? Because Joseph was not Jesus' father. He was born of a woman. He was born of Mary. That was his human progenitor. And then God, the Father, obviously, was on the other side of that equation. Look at Galatians 4.4. 4. The Bible says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And so, if you think about the fact that the book of Matthew emphasizes the fact that Jesus Christ was king of the Jews, right? And it gives that genealogy in Matthew chapter 1 of his, uh, his kingly line. But it does not go to Mary, it goes to Joseph. So it had nothing to do with his physical nativity because it was just Joseph who was his stepfather who was descended from David, Solomon, Rehoboam, and all the kings of Judah. Then when we get into the book of Mark, it emphasizes Jesus Christ as a servant. So there is no genealogy. He's made himself of no reputation. Then when we get into the book of Luke, a book that emphasizes the humanity of Christ, we have the genealogy of Mary. And it does not go back to Israel. It does not go back to Abraham. Yes, it does along the way, but it really goes all the way back to Adam, showing that Jesus Christ is the son of man, the son of uh, the human race is what that's referring to. Now, We've got two theories. I've, I've articulated why I believe that the woman is basically Eve representing all of mankind because she is the woman who is the mother of all living. I showed you that connection between Genesis 3 and Revelation 12. But then there's also another theory that I told you that said that there are people who believe that the woman is Israel. Okay, now we have those two theories in front of us. Let's see which of those theories lines up with the events of the book of Revelation the way that they actually play out. Because whenever we're faced with something that is illustrative or, or a parable, you know, we need to go to something a little more clear to help us clarify what the Bible is saying. Because in Revelation chapter 12, let's face it, this is not literal. I mean, I don't think that anyone would disagree with the fact that Revelation 12 is not a literal passage. Yes, John literally saw this, but these things are symbolic because of the fact that the Bible says in verse 1, there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. Okay, we obviously know that a woman literally could not wear the sun. That is figurative. The moon under her feet. Obviously, this is symbolic. Okay, upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. Again, that is symbolic. And then we see the dragon ready to devour the child as soon as it's born. Is that literal? No, because we know that that was actually Herod sending his soldiers to go and kill the child. Not literally a dragon who's going to physically eat the child, but it symbolizes that, okay? This chapter is not literal at all. It's very obvious. And here's my rule of thumb when I study the Bible. I always assume things are literal unless it's obvious that it's not literal. I take the literal interpretation. However, this is clearly not literal. It's impossible for it to be literal. Therefore, it's clearly symbolic. And when we see the woman fleeing into the wilderness and the dragon spewing a flood of water out of his mouth, 
All of this is symbolic. So whenever we're faced with a parable or an allegory or something that is symbolic, we need to study scriptures that are a little more clear in order to help us understand what's going on in this story in chapter 12. And I think this is one of the most difficult chapters in the whole book of Revelation because of the fact that it's heavily symbolic. Well, first of all, let's lay down some key things. At the end of uh, verse 17 there, it says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So at the end of the chapter, he's going out to make war with the seed of the woman, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Well, if you jump down to chapter 13, verse 7, it says this, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So what we see at, in verse 2 of chapter 13 is that the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard and his feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. We'll get more into that when we uh, go through the sermon on chapter 13. But right here we see the Antichrist is given his authority and he is put in power by whom? The dragon, by Satan. So in 1217, Satan is saying he's going to go out and make war with the seed of the woman, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. In the next breath, the Antichrist shows up, and what's his goal? To make war with the saints. Obviously not a coincidence. Obviously the Antichrist making war with the saints in Revelation 13, 7 is the fulfillment of what the dragon said he would do in chapter 12, verse 17. That's pretty easy to see, isn't it? Okay, now ask yourself this question. Who is the dragon making war with in Revelation 13, 7 when he's making war with the saints? Well, it's really obvious as you study the New Testament that the saints are those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter whether they be Jew or Gentile, bond or free. Uh, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if you would turn there quickly, I mean, we could go to a ton of scriptures showing you that anyone who has been sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ is a saint. Anyone who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ is a saint. But let me just give you one example. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, the Bible reads, "...under the church which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus..." called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of the Lord Je of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. So the Bible says that those at Corinth here that he's referring to that are saints, he says they're saints along with everybody who in every place calls on the Lord Jesus Christ, showing that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord is saved and they are a saint, according to 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2. And so when he says he's making war with the saints in Revelation 13, 7, it means that he's making war with believers. And then in the next breath in Revelation 13, 7, it says power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So we're not really seeing any indication here that the saints are anything different than the saints always are referring to, which is just believers, those that are saved, those who've been sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, some people have said, well... They said the woman represents Israel, but they said the woman represents saved Israel. I've heard people say this, you know, the woman represents, you know, uh, believing Israel. Well, if the woman represents believing Israel, then why is it when the devil fails to defeat the woman or to consume the woman, why is it that then he turns to the seed of the woman which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's obviously two different groups, isn't it? Because first, he's persecuting the woman. And for 1260 days, she is basically protected from Satan's attack. He sends the flood. The earth helps the woman, swallows up the flood. So because he is angry at failing to devour the woman or to kill the woman, he then decides, well, if I can't defeat the woman... I'm going to go after her seed instead, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So in Revelation chapter 12, first you see him persecuting the woman, and then when he fails to accomplish that, he goes out to devour her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Therefore, if the woman represents those that are saved or those that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, that would not make any sense because why is it a separate group when he goes after the saved? Do you see what I mean by that? 
Because in chapter 17, he, or chapter 12, verse 17, he switches to going after the ones who are saved and keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Initially, he's just going after the woman in general. Now, when is this taking place? Well, remember, the chronology starts over in chapter 12 with the birth of Christ. So when we're talking about the 1260 days and the time times and half a times in Revelation chapter 12, we are not talking about the second half of Daniel's 70th week. We are talking about the first half of Daniel's 70th week. And the reason that that is made obvious is that the, the devil seeks to persecute the woman during the time that she's fleeing into the wilderness for three and a half years or 1260 days, right? When he fails to accomplish that, then he goes to make war with the saints. Then in chapter 13, we start out the chapter with the Antichrist being placed into total power, receiving the deadly wound, his deadly wound is healed, and then an image is made unto the beast, and anyone who will not worship the image is killed, and that image is, of course, the abomination of desolation. And so when we get to chapter 13, we're dealing with the abomination of desolation, which initiates great persecution or great tribulation of God's people, of the saints. So therefore, if the persecution of those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, who are the saints, takes place after the abomination of desolation, which is the midpoint, meaning that that intense persecution takes place in the second half of Daniel's 70th week, right after the midpoint, then that means that the woman is being persecuted in the first half. Is everybody following what I'm saying? The first half is that 1260 days, which makes perfect sense because the first half of Daniel's 70th week is 1260 days, as can be demonstrated elsewhere. And so... Who is the devil persecuting for the first half of Daniel's 70th week? That will tell us who the woman is, right? Because if we can ascertain from this that the woman is being persecuted in the first half, because when he fails to accomplish that, then he goes after the seed, then he makes war with the saints, then the abomination of desolation is set up, which causes the intense persecution of God's people that we read about in Revelation 13, where anyone who will not worship the beast will be killed. And don't tell me believers are not going to be being killed en masse because there's going to be a great multitude of those that are beheaded appearing in heaven and it's saying, hey, they didn't take the mark of the beast. And consequently, they were beheaded for the cause of Christ and they live and reign with Christ a thousand years. So if we have a parable and we're having trouble with the interpretation and we're saying, okay, the woman, is it Israel or is it Eve representing all of mankind because Jesus is the son of man and Jesus was born of a woman? Well, first of all, another piece of evidence on the side of it being Eve is that Israel is a man. Israel's not even a woman. I mean, Eve is a woman. Israel is a man. And you say, well, but the whole nation is often referred to as a woman. Oh, really? Where? The nation of Israel is often referred to as a woman, often referred to in the female gender. Where? Now, I know that you might point to passages in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and I'm not saying it's there. I'm just saying I don't see it. I mean, if it's that often, where's it at? And I'm not saying it isn't there. You know, I don't know everything, but I haven't seen it. I mean, I've seen a lot of times in Jeremiah and Ezekiel where God referred to the nation of Judah as a woman, where he used a parable about divorcing, you know, the nation of Judah and referring to the nation of Israel, meaning only the ten tribes, and uh, Judah as being sisters, you know, just for a parable and for an illustration. But really, you know, Israel is a man in the Bible. And, and you know, Jesus is not often called the son of Israel, but he's very often called the son of man. And he was born of a woman, being Mary. But basically, you know, if you really look at it, he came from Eve, because she's the mother of all living. Therefore, she's the mother of Jesus Christ as well. But if we don't know who the woman is and we've got two theories, the, the Mary theory goes out the window pretty fast. Okay. But if we've got two theories, okay, nation of Israel or we've got the, uh, the, you know, just all of mankind. Basically, Eve is the woman representing just the human race in general. Let's compare the events that we know about the first half of Daniel's 70th week. And, and, and let's compare them to those two different theories. Okay, well, what do we know about the first half of Daniel's 70th week? Isn't the first thing that happens the first four seals? 
And what is the first seal? The Antichrist goes forth conquering and to conquer. What's the second seal? The Bible says that another horse went out which was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. So the events of the second seal are that peace is taken from the earth, and that the whole world is at war and killing one another. Now, does that sound like a persecution directed at Israel or at mankind in general? I mean, who is suffering? Just think about it this way. Who is suffering from the events of the first and second seal? The nation of Israel or mankind? Mankind, clearly. Okay, what about the third seal? When the third seal is opened, it says that there went out another horse, a black horse, he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny and see thou heard not the oil and the wine. Referring to very high food prices. And I talked about that in chapter six. And so are very high food prices and famines something that sounds like it's only directed at the nation of Israel? Or does it sound like it's directed at mankind in general? Okay, what about the events? And, and just flip back to Revelation six quickly. Look at the events of the fourth seal. It says in uh, chapter 6, verse number 7, And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Now look, does Israel take up the fourth part of the earth? Absolutely not. So who does it look like the events of the fourth seal are directed at? Does it look like it's an attack on Israel or does it look like it's an attack on mankind? Clearly mankind. I mean, isn't it, isn't it simple? Now, the attack on Israel takes place in the second half of Daniel's 70th week. That is where basically Jerusalem is made desolate, the abomination of desolation set up. You know, the nation of Israel is teamed up with the Antichrist in the first half of uh, Daniel's 70th week. So we do not see Israel being persecuted, but do we see mankind in general being harmed and suffering greatly at the hands of Satan? and at the hands of the Antichrist, creating all this world warfare, creating the famine, creating uh, death and pestilence and so forth. And by the way, I believe that all of these things are man-made. They're clearly not the wrath of God, and I've proved that in other sermons. These are uh, engineered in order to put the Antichrist in power because it takes a crisis you know, in order to put a world government like that in, and the crisis is created with those first four seals. And when we go to the book of Matthew 24, Jesus talks about the same things. He talks about false Christ, false prophets. Then he talks about warfare, rumors of wars, nation rising against nation. He talks about famine. He talks about pestilence. And he says, all these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. So first, it's just the world in trouble. The world is suffering. The world is in famine. The world is at war. The world is suffering mass casualties. Then they go after God's people. And it says, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. That's what we see with the fifth seal open where there's all the martyrs there. And that's why Jesus said, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, who so readeth let him understand, then shall be great tribulation. Okay? And that's when God's people are going to be killed en masse. And so this is the order that it goes in. You've got the first four seals, right? Then they deliver you up to be afflicted and kill you, abomination of desolation. And then with the, that's the fifth seal. And then when the sixth seal opens, you've got the sun and moon darkened, Christ comes in the clouds, and he gathers the elect with the great sound of a trumpet. If the 1260 days are referring to the first half of the week, it makes a lot more sense to believe that all of mankind is represented by the woman, which is Eve, because Jesus was born of a woman. Because look, when he fails to destroy the woman, then he goes after the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Well, if the woman represents all of humanity because it's Eve, then it makes sense. He's attacking everyone for 1260 days. Then he goes after the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's the saved that he's going after 
in the second half of the week. And thank God that time is cut short. He does not uh, dominate against the saints for the entire second half because it's cut short by the coming of Jesus Christ in the clouds just a few months into the second half of Daniel's 70th week. Now, let's look at some more details of chapter 12 here. Who is the woman? If we say it's mankind, well, let's, let's look at how Satan finally tries to destroy the woman. Because first he tries to persecute her, but she escapes into the wilderness, right? So what does he do when she escapes? It says in verse number 15, And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. So what is the devil's goal here in verse 15? He wants the woman to be drowned. So he sends a flood out of his mouth that he might cause the woman to be carried away of the flood. Now, is this a literal flood? You know, it's, it's hard to say when you're looking at parables. Go back to Daniel chapter 7, if you would. And you say, well, Pastor Anderson, you got this sermon completely all wrong because, you know, Revelation 12 is about the second half of Daniel's 70th week. You know, it just doesn't make any sense, my friend, because it's not until after he fails to defeat the woman that he goes after the seed. And that's when the Antichrist is put in power. I mean, to believe that Revelation 12 is about the second half, you're basically saying that chapter 13 comes before chapter 12. You know, and, and you're, you're basically throwing the whole thing out of whack. Okay, when it's in a nice chronological order, the way it sits in the Bible. Okay, but it says in Daniel chapter number 9 is where I actually want to be. The Bible says in verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to, to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Watch this. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And at the end of the war, desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the ablation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, I'm not going to pretend to understand all of the implications here with verses 26 and 27. But I will say this. I find it very interesting that at the end of verse 26, there is a flood mentioned right before the mention of the desolations, which is referring to the abomination of desolation brought up in the next verse. I find that very interesting that at the end of verse 26, it says, the end thereof shall be with a flood. And then it says that unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. Okay, so it seems like during that period of warfare, there's going to be a flood. And then at the end of the war, desolations are determined. And then he goes into the abomination of desolation in verse 27. So this is just a theory. I'm just speculating here. But it, I believe that possibly the flood in Revelation 12 is referring to a literal flood. Now, other interpretations have been that when the Bible says that the dragon casts out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman then, you know, that's referring to armies, like just a, a flood of soldiers or a flood of troops. But wait a minute. He says water as a flood after the woman. I mean, it seems like he's indicating that it's water and that it's coming after the woman and that the earth opens its mouth and swallows up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Now, let's say this is a literal flood being described in Revelation 12, you know, kind of tying it in with what we saw in Daniel 7. Then basically... This would go back to what God said after he destroyed the earth for the first time. You remember how he promised? And he made a really big deal about it. He made a big point to say, I will never flood the earth again. Do you remember that? And he said over and over again, I'm not going to flood the earth. I'm not going to destroy the earth with water. And he put the rainbow in the sky as a sign of that. Well, let's say that the devil's goal is to just kill everyone on the planet. You say, why would that be his goal? He hates mankind. He hates human. I mean, look, is there any indication in the Bible anywhere that the devil loves us or that the devil loves anybody? I mean, does the devil even love his minions? 
Now, let's look at some of the most satanic people that exist today. Who are they? You know, Prince Philip, Ted Turner, Bill Gates, right? If we look at these globalist eugenicists, you know, these people who are basically pushing the hardest for a one world government. I mean, you want to talk about the spirit of iniquity doth already work, the spirit of antichrist. I mean, we're talking about these men who are these multi-billionaires. The Bible teaches us that the love of money is the root of all evil. These multi-billionaires, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers. And when you talk about people like Prince Philip, you know, Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, you know, Queen Beatrice and, and, and uh, all the these powerful people, what do they say that they want to do to the population of the world? They openly call for reducing the population of the world by 90%, don't they? I mean, uh, was, it, was it Prince Philip? Was he the one who said he wants to come back if he were reincarnated? He would want to come back as a deadly virus that would wipe out 90% of the human race? Isn't that a sweet thing to say? Isn't that loving? And they, oh, Bill Gates, I saw Bill Gates talking, and he talked about, he said, now there are, you know, all these different factors of global warming and climate change and carbon pollution. He said, there's the number of people on the planet. He said, there's, you know, how much stuff they're using. And, you know, he had some other factors. And he said, you know, one of these numbers is going to have to go down as close to zero as we can get it you know, population number or, you know, what kind of machines we're using, how much carbon those machines are putting out. You know, he has these different factors. And he said, one of these numbers is going to need to get as close to zero as possible. He said, let's start with population. It's literally what he said. I mean, it's, you know, everybody's seen it. I mean, it's out there. And so he openly talks about wanting people dead because you can't reduce the population, you know, by 90% just by handing out birth control. You do it by killing 90% of the people on the planet. And we know that these people are of Satan. They are anti-Jesus Christ. They are pro-one world government, pro-globalist. And these people want to basically annihilate 90% of the planet. And they make all kinds of movies about it in Hollywood, too. There are all kinds of movies that allude to this. Now, I just found out about this movie a couple months ago. I've never seen it, of course, because I quit watching Hollywood movies over a decade ago. But... Somebody told me about this movie called 2012, and I'd never heard of it, you know, until 2012. At the end of 2012, somebody told me about it, but I guess it's been out for years. So I went online and I read a synopsis of the movie, and basically what the movie talked about was basically the entire Earth's population being wiped out by a flood. And everybody dies in this flood, and then basically, you know, the government is the savior. Because the government, they build these arcs, like Noah's Ark, but they build these high-tech arcs just for certain people to survive. And guess who survives? The billionaires, the politicians, the elites, okay? They get to survive in these arcs that the government built just for them, didn't warn anybody, didn't tell anybody else on the earth. And again, if I'm getting it wrong, I'm sorry, I read the synopsis online, okay? But anyway, you know, they're saying, you know, we're going to build these arcs just so that the, the, the most important people can survive. And basically, like, in this, at the end of this movie, like, 99% of the earth's population is wiped out. But it's a really happy ending. Even though billions and billions of people are dead, it's a happy ending because all the elites and all the important people, they get to survive. And, you know, I mean... That solves a lot of the environmental problems. Great. You know, this is how these people are, are thinking, and this is how they're programming you. Because whenever Hollywood puts out a movie that they spend hundreds of millions of dollars on, you better know the devil has an agenda that he's trying to get across with that movie. Because Hollywood promotes all manner of wickedness through entertainment. That's why we shouldn't watch their movies. And so what I'm saying is that it's very possible that the devil, in the midst of causing all this world warfare, in the midst of causing all this famine. And look, this famine is going to be so serious. We're not just talking about, oh, people are hungry. No, people are going to be dying en masse of starvation. I mean, we're talking millions dying, millions dying in warfare, millions dying of famine, millions dying of disease, millions and millions of people dying. And I think that during this time, the devil may decide to try and flood the entire earth and kill everyone using that method. I mean, it would tie in perfectly with what we see in Revelation 12. It's just, and again, it's just a theory. It's possible. You know, the Bible doesn't talk a lot about it, so it makes me wonder, you know, why didn't the Bible talk more about this? Maybe because it's going to fail, so it's not that big of an event to talk much about. But it's possible that during the first half of Daniel's 70th week, perhaps there will be, 
you know, some kind of a, a flooding that takes place that, that is an attempt and, and it's not going to work. You know, basically the water is going to be absorbed into the earth and it's, it's not going to succeed, but it could be something that he could try because God promised that it would never happen. Maybe he's just trying to violate God's word by destroying the earth with a flood. I don't know. Anyway, I'm just throwing that out there as a possible theory. But what we do know is that the devil will persecute mankind with a goal of killing off the population in the first half of Daniel's 70 week. And we already see them talking about it. We already see them talking about killing off mass numbers of the population. We see them not at war with Israel today. When we look at the satanic uh, rulers of the darkness of this world, do we really see them going after Israel? If anything, it seems like they're propping up Israel, doesn't it? Who are they going after, though? Mankind. You know, and I think at the end of the day, these people that are serving Satan, they don't realize, you know, Bill Gates, Ted Turner, they don't realize that Satan has no love for them. He's just using them as his pawns for his own agenda. And so uh, let's just quickly finish up with everything else in this chapter that we haven't covered. The Bible talks about the fact that uh, in verse 4, the tail of the dragon drew the third part of the stars of heaven to cast them to the earth. Often angels are referred to as stars in the Bible. This is uh, referring to the fact that one third of the angels followed Satan in his rebellion and became uh, fallen angels or devils and demons. Um, so just a quick review of the passage. It started out with this woman appearing in heaven. She's pregnant. She's in labor. There's a dragon there, which represents Satan, ready to devour the child as soon as it's born. She gives birth to the child, who's to rule all nations with a rod of iron. The child is caught up unto God and to his throne, the ascension of Jesus Christ. The dragon goes out to persecute the woman, which brought forth the man-child, right? But the woman flees into the wilderness. And it says in verse number uh, 6, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought his and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens that ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. The serpent casts out water as a flood and so on and so forth. And so what we see here is that the battle that takes place in heaven clearly takes place before the persecution of the woman. Even though this chapter skips around a little bit because he says when the dragon saw that he was cast under the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. He tries that time, time, half a time, 1260 days. And then when that fails, it says the earth helped the woman, verse 16, and, and, and opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth, verse 17. And the dragon was wroth or angry with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of of Jesus Christ. So what we see is the saved are now the target in verse 17. Now that he's gone after the woman, he's ready to go after the saints. He's ready to go after the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And in chapter 13, what do we see? In chapter 13, we see that play out. We see that war with the saints play out where the devil's going to put the Antichrist in total power of the world, the mark of the beast, all that's going to be covered in chapter 13. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word, dear God, and we thank you for the easy passages and we thank you for the difficult passages that, that force us to study a little harder and, and do more comparisons and, and really look at things and uh, see if we can get to the bottom of it. Please just uh, give us understanding and clarity as we go through these passages. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
wanted to leave a history behind on what happened to me and some of the co-workers here in this county. And it kind of gives the inside look at a phosphate plant, mainly the chemical plant where phosphoric acid is made. The, our CDC and the liars in Washington, D.C. have only had success in countries that speak English for the vast majority of the disposal of their hazardous waste product. That means that you and I and our children in the United States are the largest consumers of hydrofluosilicic acid. Call it what it is. Hydrofluosilicic acid, what is that? Hydro is water, fluo, fluoride, silicic, sand, and it's missing an electron. It's acidic. It'll kill you. You take your hand dipping in like that, you're going to die. FDA in 1997 required manufacturers of toothpaste to put this warning label on it. It's the same as you'd have on a loaded 38 caliber pistol. Keep out of reach of children. And only use a little pea-sized amount, which is about the same amount that would be up in a bottle of water. And if that amount is swallowed, call the poison control center or seek professional help immediately. So if I drank a bottle of water, should I call the poison control center too? This is just insane. There are solutions out there. There are answers to this. There's a ways to get around and, and possibly clean up your system. What can we do? I really wish this project the greatest success. People need to hear this message from, from all, the, all of those that we've interviewed. This is powerful information. I imagine and then in 50 years, people will be watching this. Uh, and they'll look back and say, uh, there were some filmmakers who did know what they were covering, who weren't willing to just sell out and, and do some explosions and on-screen sex and this and that. They actually had a message for humanity. That's what you guys are doing. <laughs>